Well, again, open your Bibles to James chapter 1. We're going to walk through the book of James. And, you know, I've got a discipleship group with uh, four young men who are going to be pastors. They're serving on our staff. And we are memorizing the book of James as well. And you might want to try that. And uh, five chapters, I promise you, just a couple of verses a week, and you can memorize it. And it is really some powerful stuff. Now, why in the world does God allow trials? Does anybody recognize the name, the Apostle Paul? Does anybody know that guy? Yeah, the Apostle Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. And uh, the Apostle Paul was begging God one day to take what he called a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it was. Uh, We have no idea what it was, but something that was just irritating him no end. And he said, God, please, I'm asking you, take this away. And God said, no. Second time, God, please take this away. No. God, third time, please take this away. Now, look, if anybody could get an answer to prayer, it ought to be the apostle Paul, all right? Third time, God says, no, and here's why. This is the Gaines translation, all right? You're better off with this trial than without it. Paul, I have caught you up into heaven. I have let you seen, I have let you see heaven. I have given you inspiration. You have written almost half of what will be the New Testament. I have given you great miracles. If you didn't have this thorn in your flesh, if I didn't allow a trial to stay with you most of the time, son, it wouldn't be good. You'd get all proud. You'd get all arrogant. You'd think you were doing it. Paul, and listen, you are better with this thorn in your side than you are without it. You say, God really thinks that way? Absolutely. So God's not going to let you just sit around and be comfortable. That's what we want, isn't it, man? We want to be physically comfortable. We want to be spiritually comfortable. We don't want any discomfort. God is not interested in your spiritual comfort level. He is not interested in your comfort He is interested in you being Christ-like, all right? And for that to happen, he's going to allow trials to come into your life so that you will exercise your faith muscles. Faith is a muscle. You have to exercise it or it gets soft and flabby. And you, he's going to make sure that these trials come your way so that you will rely on him in faith and not rely on yourself. I want to talk to you about trials. Let's read the text one more time. Would you just read, since we've got it on the screen, would you just read it with me? Let's, Let's read it good and strong. Here we go. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, let's go down to verse 12 because it's connected. Here we go. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. <clears throat> give you three reasons God allows us to go through trials. Number one, he does that so that we can exhibit a cheerful response. You say, a cheerful response? God expects me to be cheerful, to respond cheerfully when I have a trial? Yes. Look at verse two. Consider it, count it, all joy, my brethren. When you encounter, come into contact with unexpectedly, various trials. Now, he's writing to Jewish Christians, 
And they were doubly hated. They were hated by the Gentiles because they were Jews. They were hated by the Jews who were not Christians because they were Christians. So really they didn't have just a whole lot of friends. They were people who were going through constant trials. James said to them, count it all joy. Consider it all joy. Consider is a verb of command. God was commanding them to look at their trials as an opportunity to display joy and joy, what is that? It's part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, and on and on. When they were joyful in their trials, they were displaying the fact that they were loving God. And he said, it's all joy. Consider it all joy, full joy, complete joy, supreme joy, the highest kind of joy. It's exactly what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And I've told you several times now but you're going to see it all the way through James. I'm going to be referring a lot back to the Sermon on the Mount because the book of James in many ways is a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 10 through 12? God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all kinds and sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. That's, there it is right there. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Notice too in James 1, 2, it's when you encounter various trials. Not if. Every Christian will inevitably experience trials. God uses them in his sovereign, sanctifying plan. Sanctification is being made more like Jesus. So it's when you encounter various trials. That word encounter is the Greek word peripipto, and it means to fall into a problem that you didn't see coming. It's kind of like back in December, Don and I were in Panama City taking a week of vacation, and we were sitting there in our car at the red light, and man, the thing turned green. The guy, the lady in front of us took off, and right when I was about to give it gas, this guy, I don't know if he's talking on his phone what he was doing, but he hit us in this big truck right by, and just smashed into the back of us. I mean, just really messed up the car and the whole bit. We didn't see it coming. That's the kind of thing he's talking about. When you encounter something, you're just minding your own business, going along, living for Jesus, reading your Bible, loving the Lord, whatever, and wham, just like getting hit in the back of a car. And that's what he means. And by the way, that, that word encounter, you can read it for what it really means in another part of the Bible there's a story Jesus tells, a parable that Jesus tells about a man who was walking down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves, fell among unexpectedly is parapipto. It's encounter. He encountered some thieves. He all of a sudden was being robbed and he was beaten. He was just walking down the road and suddenly these guys jumped him. And that's what trials do. They jump you. They jump you. You can come right out of church and you can be in a fight with your family before you get home. Amen? Don't act so holy. I said, amen? Amen. amen. That's right. You can get into, you can get in, you can have a bad thought. You can, you can read your Bible and pray and have this glorious hallelujah time and all of a sudden, wham, there's a trial. Just like that. That's what he's talking about. Various trials, by the way, diversified trials. It, it literally means multicolored. There's all kinds of trials. I want to say this to you. About the time you say, well, I think I've seen every kind of trial there is, here comes another one. You say, I didn't see that. I had no idea that you could even be, have a trial like that. I want to say this to you, by the way. Don't mistake 
trials and temptations. God sends trials to purify us, to make us more like Jesus. It's called sanctification. But God does not tempt you to sin. Now, why do I say that? Because we live in a culture that says, if somebody wants to sin, nowadays they they just say, well, God made me this way. Look at me. God doesn't make you sin. God doesn't say, thou shalt not do this, and then turn around and give you the desire to do it. You say, okay, where do I get those desires? There are three sources of your desire to sin. Number one, the devil will tempt you. Number two, this evil world will tempt you. But number three, let's get some ownership into it. We have a sinful nature that will tempt us as well, okay? So it could be the devil, it could be the world, it could be our own sinful nature, but it's not God. Don't say, God made me this way if you're trying to justify your sin. God does not tempt you to sin. He tests you to make you more like Jesus, but he never, ever tempts you to sin. He gives you those times of testing so that instead of just curling up in a fetal position and crying, and I'm not in any way minimizing your suffering, I'm not, but you got to come out of that and you got to start giving God joy. The Bible talks about a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes praise costs you something. You got to sacrifice sometimes when you're praising the Lord and display Christian joy. There was a man, we don't know his name, in the third century AD that left behind this beautiful little paragraph in written form. And he was writing to a friend. These were some of his last words before he died. And he said, you know, we live in a bad world. It is an incredibly bad and sinful world. But I have discovered in the midst of this bad world a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any sinful pleasure in this life. They are despised. They are persecuted, but they don't care. They have overcome the world. These people I'm talking about are the Christians, and I have become one of them. Why did he become a Christian? Because he saw them going through trials And they gave God glory anyway, not for the trial, but in the midst of the trial. They were joyful. You can experience, exhibit rather, a cheerful response when you're going through a tough time, when you're going through a hard time. You can praise God in pain. You can celebrate in suffering. You can bless him when you're under a burden. Remember Job? Now, I want to say this to you. I'm not, I'm not in any way minimizing anybody's trial in here, but I would seriously doubt we've got anybody here who went through trials at the level of Job. He lost all of his farm animals. He lost all of his crops. He lost all of his money. He lost his health. He lost his 10 children. He had 10 children, and they were all killed. The walls, a tornado came through, a strong wind came through and pushed the walls down and killed all 10 of his children at the same time. And it all happened at the same time. The devil had said to God, if you didn't take such good care of Job, he would curse you to your face. And God said, you can let things happen to him. You can let trials come to him, but don't take his life. And all of it was stripped away. And then his wife comes up. They were her children too. And she says, hey, why don't you just curse God and die? She was so frustrated with life. 
she was ready to give up. So what's Job do? He's got even his better half is telling him to curse God. What's he going to do? Is he going to do what God tells him to do, to bless God in the midst of your persecution or to curse God? Well, he chose the right way, Job 2, verse 10. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. One of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life was the guy that was a pastor here before me, Adrian Rogers. Godly man. Was pastor here for 32 years. And if you bought one of his books, he wrote almost 30 books. I don't even think I've read 30 books, but anyway, he, he wrote 30 books. I have read 30 books. But if, you, if he signed his book to you, he always wrote this verse, the reference to it, Psalm 31, 34, verse 1. It's so good. Let's read it together. Would you read it with me? I will bless the Lord, say it with me now, at all times. Let's read that one again. I will bless the Lord at all times. Let's read it again. I will bless the Lord. His praise shall what? Continually be what? In my mouth. I may be hurting on the inside, but I'm going to let his praises come out of my mouth. That's a sacrifice of praise. That's when you do right, when you don't feel like doing it. That's when God says, now that's my child right there. That's my Job right there. The apostles were beaten, and they rejoiced in the midst of it. They were beaten because they preached the gospel. Acts chapter 5, 41 and 42, so they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Paul said in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces something, endurance, that thing that makes you stick to something even when you're tired. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord when? Always, always. Again, I will say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything, not just in a few things, but in everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Some of you have lost your jobs. You shouldn't praise God for that, but you can have the faith to praise God in the midst of that. God can give you another job. Some of you have lost a loved one. Some of you have lost your health. Some of you have lost other things. Consider it all joy. When you put it all together, consider it all joy. My brethren, when you encounter, when you fall into unexpected trials, God allows trials so you can exhibit a cheerful response. Secondly, God allows trials so that you can experience Christ-like results. God's going to use your trials to take away some of the unchristlike things in your life. He's going to give you some good results if you'll just walk with him through the trial. Look at verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces something called endurance. That word testing, dokomion, means to analyze to examine. And it's really a word for purging metal. When you put metal, raw material metal, in a fire, it burns away the residue, and what remains, it, it what remains is 
the tested residue rather, it keeps the residue and burns away the, the dross and the waste. First Peter was written to persecuted Christians as well. And Peter said the same thing that James says. He said it in first Peter one, six through seven. If you, in this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials so that the proof, the testing, the examining of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even through though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's something about testing that's like fire, and it gives a pure quality to faith. And that testing and that pure quality of faith leads to another result, and that is endurance. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Hupo mone, and it means to steadfastly stand firm and keep on going. Romans 2, 7 says, he will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good. That word keep on is the same word for endurance seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. It's staying power. It is spiritual grit. It is resilience. It is stamina. In the words of the great theologian Rocky Balboa, here's what it is, and I quote, it's not how hard you can hit that makes you a winner but it's how hard you can get hit and get up and keep going. Endurance. But you get up. And life will hit you. The devil will hit you. Life will hit you. And look, you can be reading your Bible and praying and being walking with God, and you'll get hit in the jaw. Why? God's doing something. You get up, and you keep on going. Romans 5, 3, we rejoice in our sufferings. What? We rejoice? He didn't say four, he said in. Sufferings come, we're going to rejoice. Rejoice. Blessings come, we're going to rejoice. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. That thing that makes you stick with something. Hebrews 10, 36, for you have need of endurance. Endurance. So that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. James 5, 11, we count those blessed who endured. There it is. Who persevered. You've heard of the endurance of Job. You've seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. <coughs> that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. So we're going to have this perfected endurance if we'll just Stay faithful to God in the midst of the trials. But that's not all. God's going to mature us through that endurance. Verse 4, let endurance have its perfect result. Telios, perfect. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You say, oh, Brother Steve, I'm not perfect. It doesn't mean perfection in the sense of sinlessness, it means that God is maturing you. When it talks about things, it refers more to being perfect, but when this teleos is referring to people, it talks about maturity, and that's what's going on. Moral and spiritual maturity. That's exactly what Jesus was talking about. Again, back in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 48, if you've ever struggled with this verse, like many people do, 
Jesus said, you are to be perfect. Therefore, you are to be perfect, teleos, as your heavenly Father is perfect. People look at that and say, I can't be perfect. He's not saying you never can sin. He's not saying that. What he's saying is you can, you are to be mature. You are to be growing more like Christ, even as your Father is this perfect, this mature God. He is our our object. He is the one we're trying to emulate and follow. You can grow. You can be more like Christ. Over the centuries, some have tried to say this means perfectionism. We're never going to be perfect. How many of you know that? Does anybody know that? Have you, have you realized that? But we are, nevertheless, to strive for perfection, even though we won't ever hit it. All right? But don't ever say you're sinless. <laughs> John said in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, if we claim that we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. We're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness or unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar. We're showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I want to say this to you again. I said it today. I can't remember if I said it in last service or this service. You know, after you, this is the third time I've preached this sermon, all right? But I want to say this to you. If I've already said it, it, it deserves to be said again. There's not a person in here that has it all together, including me. Amen. Not a person in here has it all together. We're all a bunch of sinners that need Jesus. Amen. We have weaknesses, and we all go through trials every one of us. And the devil might be telling you, hey, man, you don't belong here. These people all have it all together. Look at me. If you don't have it all together, there's not a better place for you than right here because you're surrounded by like people. All right? We can't reach a state of sinful perfection, but we can reach a state of ever-increasing spiritual Maturity. We can, as 2 Peter 3.18 says, we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I may not be what I ought to be, but I'm farther ahead than I was a year ago. Have you ever wondered how lift, lifting weights makes your muscles stronger? You ever wondered about that? Well, I want you to watch. This is a, uh, a veteran, a U.S. veteran. And when you see his muscles, you're going to say, mine don't look like that. But listen to what he says. Watch. I'm A.J. Tucker, and this is what happens to your muscles when you lift weights. Whenever you lift weights, for example, let's say if I'm doing a bicep curl, I curl the weight and it tears down my muscle over time. It takes about 24 to 72 hours for my muscles to recover. If I did a really intense workout, it may take an entire week. But what happens to the muscles is you get thousands of micro tears in the muscle, and then it takes time to recover. The muscle rebuilds. It comes back a little bit bigger, a little stronger, and it's prepared for that same exact workout. And so that's why you change the workout. You do it again and you increase the intensity. You tear down the muscles again, they come back a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. That's what happens when you work out. It tears down the muscle so that when it grows back, it's just a little bit stronger and a little bit bigger. And that's what God is doing with you and me when we go through trials. It's like spiritually working out. And God wants you to be strong spiritually. So he allows difficulties to come your way. So you won't be a spiritual couch potato. God wants you to be like Christ. God wants you to work out spiritually. God wants you in the Word. He wants you praying. He wants you walking in faith. He, and you'll go through trials, and you'll say, God, I don't like this, 
My spiritual muscles are burning. I've got a lactic attack here. But Lord, I'm telling you, I believe on the other side, I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be more like Jesus. I don't, I don't like the process, but I like the results. I want to go with you, Lord. We can experience Christ-like results because of trials. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Next time a trial comes along, said, you're nothing but a spiritual treadmill. You're nothing but a spiritual elliptical machine. You're just some spiritual weights that I'm going to lift, and I'm going to get a burn out of it. You're just a spiritual jog in the park, just a lap in a spiritual pool, just a mile on an exercise bike, but I am not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I want to say this about God. If you can only bench press spiritually 50 pounds, he won't put 225 pounds on your chest, all right? There's a word that means trial and temptation. You can use it either way. It, we usually say temptation when we look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It can go either way, but it also talks about trials. No temptation test or trial has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, that is, everybody's going through it. That's why I was trying to say a while ago, nobody has it all together. Everybody's being tempted. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are able. Did you catch that? But with the temptation or the testing or the trial, he will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. If you'll just persevere, if you won't quit, there's the deal. Don't quit. Don't quit. God will give you Christ-like results. Well, why do we go through trials? Why does God allow this? Is there a better way? Can we just take a pill? No. God allows us to go through trials so we can exhibit a cheerful response, so that we can experience the Christ-like results. But there's a third reason, so we can enjoy our cherished reward. Look at verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Let's all say that together. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, whoa, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's a blessing on the other side of your burden. There's a treasure on the other side of your trial. There's a Jesus on the other side of your junk. You're going through a tough time, but when you see his face, your tough time will be gone. You won't even think about it. How many of you know that life is not like this platform, it's not a level road. This is pretty easy to walk across. Life has got hills. Life has got muddy roads. Life has got potholes, and you can turn your ankle in a heartbeat in life. You can fall flat of your face. You can walk out of this room full of the Holy Ghost, full of a word and the whole bit, and before you get home, you can have a trial. I'm telling you, that's what life is. But there's a better place coming, amen? And if we'll just persevere, if we'll just keep going and say, you know what? It may not be zippity doo dah, zippity day, my oh my, what a beautiful day. It may be rain coming down, storms coming down, all kinds of things coming down, people mad at me, people yelling at me, people this, that, and other, and things not going right, money not coming in, this not going on right, health not good, home not doing good, all these things. But no matter what happens, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to give Him glory in the midst of every trial. I'm going to keep on doing it. You know why? Because this is not my home. I am just a pilgrim passing through. And the, what I'm really looking forward to is making it 
to the other side. That's where the reward is. That's where the reward is. And that's exactly what he's saying in verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Who's going to give that to you? Jesus. He's already given it to you in a way. He gave you eternal, abundant life. He gave you abundant life here in salvation. The minute you got saved, you were dead. He put life in you, the life of Jesus Christ in you. And then one of these days, you're going to see him face to face. And it won't just be abundant life. It will be everlasting life. Victorious life forever. He will give you the crown of life, which the Lord has promised. How many of you know that Jesus cannot tell a lie? Amen. The Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you love Jesus? You may be the worst Christian in here, but if you love Jesus, man, God has a promise for you. It's not just the strong Christians that never seem to mess up. It's even the weakest one. If you love Jesus, man, if you love the Lord, he's promised to give you crown of life. You're going to persevere. You're going to push through. You are going to stand your ground. And no matter what the devil throws at you or what this world throws at you or what you can dig up with your own sinful nature, you are not quitting. You are not going to quit. Look at me. Here's the Christian life. Two, three steps forward, one step back. Two or three more steps forward, one step back. It's not just some constant, well, I'm going to do good the rest of my life. No. You fall down sometimes. You mess up. And God picks you up, brushes you off. If you belong to Jesus, he will never leave you nor forsake you, even when you mess up. He doesn't love your sin, but he loves you. Once you've been approved, you're going to get the crown of life crown of life. Jesus wore a crown of thorns so he could put on your brow when you come before him the crown of life. <laughs> you know, let's just be honest. We can do some tough things if there's a reward out there. Amen? When I was in high school, I chose to play football. I wasn't very big. I wasn't very strong when I started out in eighth grade. I started growing, and by my senior year, we had a really good football team. We'd had three winning seasons in a row. It had never, hap it had never happened at Dyersburg High School. My senior year, we had an all-offensive line that was seniors. We had an all-American tailback. We had a fullback that played four years at UT Knoxville, Jimmy Noonan. It was all, he was their nose guard, started as a freshman. We had some great players. And I can remember one day, it was September, early September 1974, my senior year, we were practicing football, and it was hot, 45 of us. And we were all taking a knee, and classes let out. They let us in the sixth period, the sixth hour of the day, we could practice football. We'd already started our practice, and we were taking a knee. So all the guys that didn't play football were driving by, and it was hot. It's not only hot in West Tennessee, it's humid. That's why it's so cold outside, is because it's not only cold, but it's humid and cold, all right? It'll shake your bones out there right now. And when it's hot, it's like an oven in Memphis. And so we were out there and we were sweating in Dyersburg. And some guy yelled at us. He was in a car, safely away from all of us. And he yelled at us. Here's what he yelled. I'm so sorry that you're hot and we're not. And he kept driving. And our coach said this. I'll never forget it. I've never forgot it. He said, boys, don't you worry about them. 
They're not paying the price to know what it feels like to win a game on Friday night. Now, that may not sound like much to you, but what he was saying, this work that you're putting in is going to pay off, and it did. That was the first year Dyersburg High School ever went to the state playoffs. Nowadays, you can lose eight games and go to the state playoffs. We've dumbed down everything, amen? But back then, you had to win out. You had to go undefeated. My junior year, we were nine and one, and we didn't make the playoffs. That's crazy. No, that was, well, I won't go, I won't say that. That was a different day. Let me just say that. Different day. And so we're nine and one. Doesn't look like we're going to make the playoffs, but Memphis East beats the unbeaten team here in Memphis. And Memphis East was nine and one, so we got to play Memphis East. We beat them. We go to 10 and one. We go to Nashville, and we get beat by the team that won the state championship. But we would have never known it. We would have never known the joys that was coming if we hadn't been out there practicing in that hot Dyersburg heat. I'm not trying to tell you a football story. I'm trying to tell you about life. Life will knock you down and laugh at you. Life will hit you when you're trying to live for Jesus. Life is no respecter of persons. Life will come up, look you right in the eye, laugh at you, and slap you silly. The devil will do that. The world will do that. And sometimes your own sin results in that. Amen? But that's when you say, you know what? I'm getting up. I'm not going to quit. I'm not. I may get knocked down nine times, but I'm going to get up ten times, and I'm not going to quit. Trials, whatever comes my way, I don't want you, but I'm not afraid of you because I've got a God who's going to pick me up and carry me home. He's going to take me to the house. He's going to reward me. Sinful old me, he's going to reward me one of these days. He's going to put the crown of life on my head one of these days. Quit. Go back. Go back to what? Go back to rebellion? Go back to that sinfulness? No. That's back there. I'm forgetting all that. I'm reaching forward to what lies ahead. I'm going to persevere. I may get knocked down. But bless God, I'm getting up. I'm not going to quit. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Oh, I've been to a lot of places and I've seen a lot of faces. Oh, but there's times that I felt so all alone. In those lonely hours, in those precious lonely hours, God let me know that I was His own. I'm singing through it all. Sing it with me. Let's all stand. Through it all, I've learned to trust in you. Amen. I've learned. Trust in God 
thank him for those mountains I thank him for the valleys I thank him for the storms he has brought me through As if I never had a problem I wouldn't know my God could solve them I wouldn't know what faith in his word would do I'm singing through it all sing it out with me now oh through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus oh I have learned to trust in God I'm singing through it all oh through it all I have learned to depend upon his word. Could we sing that chorus one more time? Oh, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Let's give God praise even in the midst of trials. Amen. Amen. Let's just be honest. How many of you are going through a trial right now? I got my hand up. How many of you have been through a trial lately? Anybody else out there? I like to say it this way. You know, it seems like this. This is really, I think, the way it is. You're either going into a trial or you're in a trial or you're just leaving a trial. But God will see you through. How many of you would say God has led you through trials before? Anybody out there? Amen. He's a faithful God, is he not? And the same God that led you through that other trial, even if this trial is bigger, he can lead you through, and he will. Stay with the stuff. If you don't know the Lord, you don't have any help. You're out there on your own. You don't have any way to have victory over trials. I got saved 40 Five years ago, it was either last Wednesday night or this Wednesday night. I got saved, gave my heart to Jesus as a freshman in college. God changed my life. If you don't know Jesus, you need to be saved. And I want to encourage you today to repent of your sins, to turn from your sin doesn't mean you'll be sinless, but it does mean you're sorry for your sins. You don't want to live like that. You want to start living for Jesus, so you're going to do a 180 spiritually. You're going to repent, and then you're going to believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to give you eternal life, and then you're going to receive him. You're going to invite him to come into your life, and you're going to give him all the controls. You're not just going to sit in the, dry, in the rider's seat. You're not just going to sit in the back seat. You're going to get in the trunk and let him drive you, all right? He can do whatever he wants, whatever he wants. You don't tell him anything about what to do. He knows where you need to go. You just get your hands off of the wheel and give your heart to Christ. If you've never done that, will not you pray this with me right now? Pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I need to be saved. I want to be saved. I turn, I repent of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I receive you right now. Come into my life. I call on your name. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. And I thank you by faith that I'm saved. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.